Hi there, welcome to Penny Saves Paldea, where I take the fails of Scarlet and Violet and turn them into a generous dose of copium-laced fanfiction. As with my other videos, the premise here is that the glitches of Paldea are canon and the important characters notice them. I'll review the fails I'm writing into this week's story and then I will read the result for your amusement. I'll be working with logic fails today rather than straight up glitches, so let's see what's on the table. First up is the logic fail of the Academy dress code. Ever since you could customize your characters in XY, most players' first visit to any big town is the clothing shop and stylist. Gen 9 opened with more appearance options than ever before, and it was awesome! Until we realized that this was the highlight of the game's customization. You're stuck in the Academy uniform. You can change out some accessories, but your options there just make the whole dress code look even more illogical. So, let me get this straight. Penny's Eevee backpack is off limits, but I can have a helmet obscuring most of my face? You realize by the rules of the paper-thin disguise that I could pretend to be anyone now. In fact, I'm going to have Penny do exactly that. The next logic fail is, well, pretty much the whole Paldean economy. Juliana gets paid by Penny during Operation Starfall, but where do other students get the cash and TM materials for their treasure hunts? It's not like taking down the gyms or beating high-level terror raids is trivial for kids with level 5 starters. Also, it becomes pretty clear about midway through Operation Starfall that you're the jerk coming in here and tearing the friend group apart. And yet you keep pushing forward. One could say it's because you promised Penny, but a gotta pay the bills headcanon wouldn't be out of place here. Our final fail is more on me than the game. I just wanted to know. How much peanut butter can I buy? Having a perpetual bag of holding is standard for video games, but in Pokemon it's usually potions and pokeballs you stock up on. Now it can be sandwich ingredients, which help get eggs and shinies, and this idea amused me greatly. I love shiny hunting, but I am definitely more of a Masuda method gal, because wild shinies can do things like this. So when I found out you could get eggs by just letting the game sit there, I may have gone overboard in my peanut butter purchases. Also, if I ever do any shiny hunting videos, they will involve one of my characters running around with some eggs to some soothing nature sounds because that is as intense as I like the hunt to get. To combine all these fails, mine included, into a story, I'll start with Penny and route to the Rukba squad space. Juliana is already there, having just purchased an unreasonable amount of peanut butter. Penny is about to cancel Operation Starfall to focus her studies on Paldea's anomalies, and Juliana is about to lose a major source of income in the process. Let's see how she takes it. Penny is dozing off to the rhythmic flapping of a surprisingly airworthy mob of squawkabilly when her phone buzzes with a new message. She adjusts her glasses from where she's been slouching to read it. Not sure if you got the alert or not, but I did defeat the Sagan squad, so whenever you're able to send the LP for that, I'd appreciate it. Juliana. Seriously? Penny says, then covers her mouth. Not that the taxi driver is paying her any attention. The winds are so loud up here, it's hard to understand each other even when they shout. Penny slips on the riding helmet she's brought, the one with a conveniently dark visor. Why the dress code permits students to obscure their faces but forbids fuzzy backpacks shaped like Pokemon is beyond her understanding. The helmet not only cuts down on the wind, it sends a clear message of, I do not want to speak to you. She likes it. What she does not like is Juliana asking to be paid for actively undermining the mission of saving Paldea. And she detests the fact that she told Juliana to do this in the first place. Couldn't people just figure out what they needed to do without the inconvenience of communication? It would make life so much simpler. I did get the alert, but I'm traveling right now and reception is spotty, she types back to Juliana. The reception is fine, but with the number of lies she's piled up so far, what's one more? Besides, she needs more time to work up the nerve for the message she'll send once the payment goes out. It has to be one action than the other, so she doesn't have the chance to cower out. Payment sent, she types into the box, without hitting send yet. But I must tell you, this is the last one you'll get. I'm canceling Operation Starfall. Thank you for your help. Penny reads it over several times with deep breaths. Simple and straightforward, it'll go out with the final payment once she reaches her destination. Juliana will have to figure out how to deal with the consequences. The moment the taxi lands, Penny does it. 
With one app open, she sends the text, and then, within a matter of seconds, she flips to the banking app and sends Juliana's final payment. Relief floods her, even as the taxi takes to the sky behind her. The lies are ending here and today. Next, she'll face Team Star for the first time in person. Should she take off the helmet for that? According to her favorite book, How to Show Your Face to Your Friends by G.L. Allister, wearing a mask at first meeting can cause people not to recognize you when the mask is removed, especially if the outfit you wear with the mask is different from the one you wear without it. Since she got through breaking the news to Juliana, maybe she can greet her friends with her head held high, and then she can save everybody. It all starts with that first step, right? A girl's painful wail echoes across the green oasis of a field that surrounds the Rukba Squad's base. Penny looks over to see Juliana cresting a grassy hill, which stands in sharp contrast to the icy mountains around it. A young man, most likely the professor's son, Arvin, lays a sympathetic hand on her shoulder. What's wrong? he asks. Juliana collapses into the grass, sobbing about how she just got fired from her job and how she owes almost 20k for peanut butter jars. Where and why did she buy 20k worth of... Penny shoves her helmet back on before Juliana or Arvin can see her. Facing everybody is a noble goal, but she needs it to be a feasible one, too. Right now, that isn't happening. A sick feeling in her stomach, not unlike eating several dozen jars of peanut butter, says not to get her hopes up for the future, either. In fact, Penny is so distracted, she fails to notice a man in an Aranha Academy uniform, watching her, Arvin, and Juliana from the tall grass. If there's one thing Clavel prides himself on, it's his sense of subtlety, of knowing when the situation requires a quiet approach. A lesser director might march into the Rukba squad's base and demand to know why a wealthy business heir like Ortega would join a group like Team Star. But Clavel has chosen to follow Juliana from a distance and see what Team Star does next. She's proven herself quite capable against the Sagan squad, but Ortega's formidable crew has already demoralized her without so much as cracking open the gate. Clavel knows this because of how she cried out in great alarm only a moment ago. He cannot decipher her words from this distance, but she's been looking at her phone the whole time. Perhaps Team Star has sent her photographic evidence of their sinister plot to destroy Paldea piece by piece. Up until recently, Clavel thought the same of Team Star as everyone else. They are troublemakers, hooligans who spend class time customizing their clothing and vehicles with the most flagrant disregard for dress codes and decency. But in the past few weeks, Clavel has concluded this is all a cover-up for their truly heinous plot, pulling Paldia's reality apart at the seams. A genius-level epiphany, to be sure, but Clavel hasn't made it in a vacuum. An anonymous source sent the school a list of incidents shortly after the inception of Operation Starfall. Clavel didn't want to believe it at first, but the more he's paid attention, the more he's noticed the strange occurrences around him. It's especially bad in the classrooms. Sometimes his feet are so sluggish he can barely move in there. And to think, all this time he's blamed such effects on his questionable choice of morning coffee. The source didn't name any culprits, but Clavel knows how to read between the lines. Something bad is happening. Ergo, an organization that begins with team and ends in some jazzy-sounding noun must be responsible. How fortunate he has Cassiopeia and Juliana to help him bring these criminals to justice. He hopes to speak with her before she enters the base itself. He simply needs to watch and wait for the opportunity. Meanwhile, Juliana dries her eyes, feeling more than a little foolish as she scrolls through her account balance. True, the loss of income from Operation Starfall is a major hit— But she's completing the gym challenge is faster than most, and the pay for that is quite decent. She's never considered a career in the league before now, but the possibility has moved pretty high up her list. Of course, it will have to come after she helps Arvin maintain a consistent corporeal state. His random phasing through solid objects is really starting to worry her. Hopefully this lead is good, and someone at the Rukba squad can help. You okay there? Arvin asks. He stands awkwardly at her side, unsure of what to make of her outburst. Maybe with luck he'll forget the whole thing ever happened. Juliana nods and mutters something about her finances being less of a problem than she thought. She scrolls a little further. It looks like the store hasn't charged her for the peanut butter shipment either, since they haven't sent it out yet. Maybe she can return half for a partial refund. Oh, great, says Arvin, who surveys the base in front of them. On the outside, it looks just like the others. 
a slapped together fence, an old school bell at the gate, and billowing flags embroidered with the Team Star logo. In theory, the pastel pink of these flags would make them look softer, but as a Tinkaton trainer, Juliana knows better than anyone that fairy types are not to be trifled with. If anything, the color is more intimidating. Excuse me, but are you two going inside? Juliana startles. The quiet voice sounds familiar, but when she turns, she doesn't recognize the speaker at all. The words come from a shortish girl wearing a navy great ball sweatshirt, a shiny Eevee backpack, and a helmet that hides most of her face. She reminds Juliana of that shy girl from school, but the backpack and sweatshirt are different, and the shy girl does not wear a helmet, so they can't be the same person, can they? Oh, we're about to, Arvin says, straightening his backpack. And you are? I, I came to help with Team Star's research into the anomalies, the girl replies. My name's, uh, Jenny. Juliana introduces herself and Arvin. Jenny doesn't answer directly, but she does mutter something that sounds like, Huh, guess G.L. Alistair is right. She then turns and walks towards the gate with a slow but purposeful stride. The girl really does seem familiar, just like Clive did when he first showed up. Juliana starts to follow, but as she does, Arvin pulls her back and leans in close. Don't turn around, but there is a creepy man with purple sunglasses watching us from the grass. Pretty sure he's been following us since we left the Sagan squad. Juliana lowers her hand from its defend-my-personal-bubble position and presses Arvin for more details. Specifically, does this creepy man have a retro-gravity-defying haircut? Arvin nods. Yeah, you know him? Juliana is forced to admit that, yes, she does. And she really should have a word with him before she enters the base. She urges Arvin inside ahead of her, assuring him she'll follow when she can. He doesn't look thrilled with her answer, but he takes her at her word and follows Jenny up to the gate. It opens without either of them needing to ring the bell. Juliana can only conclude that Jenny must have called ahead somehow. She should figure out how to do that herself before the next base. It would be quite the time saver. Okay, that's all for this chapter. Thanks again to Stick Studios for the outro and to you guys for watching and subscribing. I decided to post early rather than schedule an upload while I'm on vacation, so the next video will be out June 29th. Until then, happy reading and happy training!